Okay, I guess we're gonna start in uh, a moment. Let's wait a little bit more for your piece to come in. Okay, I guess we can start slowly now. Um, so you see that uh, today's Friday and you can see that, I mean, the, the, the sixth lecture is uh, surprisingly uh, short, but it turns out that there are a lot of uh, interesting philosophical points and questions I would like to discuss with you guys. Um, and actually they are pretty uh, remarkable and important, at least in my view. So I would like to explain them all to you so that you see their significance and also that, I mean, why do we care about them? Uh, let me remind you that also if you have learned PDE or calculus of variations, and this is related to chapter three or chapter eight of Evans. But as I promised, we're gonna go much further than just there. Um, so I recall the setting on the right uh, here, you know, our our main uh, object gonna be uh, a minimizing prop. So you minimize the action functional, the integral from A to B L of eta eta dot ds. And for now, for simplicity, we put the admissible set to be just uh, curves from A, B to Rn. Later on, we're gonna consider the torus as well. For now, Rn is fine in which we have eta is continuous, this y c1, and we fix the two endpoints, eta i equals to y is fixed, and eta b equals to z is fixed. So we fix the two endpoints, and we consider all possible curves that as this y c1, so they can have corners at uh, a finite number of points that connecting the two points. Um, so this is a very, very typical classical problem in calculus of variation. And uh, we started discussing about it last time. And our standing assumption is going to be that L is in, oops. Our standing assumption is L is in CK. Uh, L is, uh, you know, locally uniformly complex. So the Hessian is always positive. And L is superlinear in V, you know. Um, so they're, they're, I mean, they're, they're, they're going to be certain, uh, no, uh, note and remark here. So the note this assumption. I'm gonna try to discuss deeply about this assumption today. I mean, um, of why and, and how and things like that. So uh, we proved last time two theorems. Uh, the first theorem was that if gamma is C2, so last time, uh, let me just record quickly. We prove two theorems. I can just record quickly here that if gamma is C2 uh, minimizer, I mean, it's, it's in C2 and it's a minimizer, then you imply that gamma satisfies the Euler Lagrange equations. It's, it's a system of, you know, n equations because this is sort of like a system, right? So this is the Euler Lagrange equation. It's, it's, um, not surprising, again, this is just a normal uh, calculus of variation techniques and we did uh, demonstrate it uh, last time. So that was the first theorem we proved. The second theorem we proved is that, you know, actually we didn't need that gamma was in C2, gamma in C1 is enough. So if gamma is C1 and gamma is a minimizer, then actually, we imply the gamma is in CK. So the regularity of gamma is the same 
as the regularity of the Lagrangian or the Hamiltonian, so it's CK. And surely CK meaning that is at least C2, so that means that gamma also satisfies the Euler Lagrange equations. Okay, so that was the two things we did last time. Of course, you're going to see that it's not natural to put a lot of assumption on the regularity of the minimizer. We're going to discuss about that certain philosophical viewpoint. Um, so we want to lower down the regularity to see, I mean, under which assumption that we can still have, you know, smoothness. And this is so the main theorem of today. So today we just prove one theorem. Um, again, the truth is not too hard, but in there, there, there's one important point. And later on, after the theorem, I'll, I'll mention a very important point of, you know, what, what are we doing? I mean, what's sort of, you know, the direction or, of, you know, research that we will have thought about uh, throughout in calculus of variation theory. So, um, so for today, we're going to prove, let's say, the third theorem that in fact, we didn't even need C1, right? So re remember that our admissible set is that uh, curly A is a set of all continuous is Y C1. And we're gonna show that with that regularity is enough, okay? So for today, what we're gonna prove is that um, if gamma is in curly A is a minimizer, minimizer, then we still have that gamma is CK and gamma satisfy Euler-Lagrange equations. Uh, so, I mean, in this admissible set, this is the best case scenario, right? So we didn't assume anything more than that. So, so I can say that we only need, we only need that gamma is continuous and this one, this one is C1, okay? So your minimizer, the starting point can be, this is gamma A equal to Y. It can be smooth up to some point and it can have a corner and then smooth up to the other point and so on and so forth up to gamma B equal to V. So it, it, it can have sort of like singularity in the gradient at certain points, you know, a priorily. And then we're gonna prove that even though that is still, uh, you know, satisfying that gamma is CK and is a minimizer. Okay. So that's our main theorem. Um, so in here, you can see that the proof goes pretty much smoothly. I'm gonna actually, you know, recall the proof with you guys and we're gonna go through it uh, carefully. Um, and hidden in this proof, there's one simple but important point that's gonna be used throughout the class. Um, so first of all, you know, we say that, you know, because gamma is this, uh, continuous this YC1, right? So that means that you can find a finite number of values so that gamma is C1 on each of the interval, okay? So, I mean, in this picture, you can see, I mean, not in this cartoon, you can see that uh, gamma I is denoted to be gamma A naught, is y, right? And this is gamma of i1 up to gamma of i2 and so on and so forth. So what we say here is that gamma is c1 on h uh, close interval ai i to ai i plus one, okay? Uh, so that we can assume again, you know, because a priori really, we assume already that our, um, you know, admissible set is pretty nice. It's this Y C1 continuous curves. Okay, so here, here's the hidden point that I didn't say it out loud. So here's a hidden lemma that, uh, you know, is there. You can see it is really easy to prove, but but what it's, it's mean is that if gamma restricted in IB is a minimizer, then, for any subinterval, CD in IB, gamma restricted in CD is also, is still 
still I minimize of the action functional. Um, maybe you call it I tutor of eta is integral from C to D. Uh, the actions of eta eta dot ds, where um, you know minimizing of eta where you have eta c equals to gamma c, eta d equals to gamma d. Okay. So what it means is that um, the minimizing property is universal. I mean, what it, you know, whatever interval, sub interval you restrict it to is still a, a minimizer. Um, this is, you know, this is pretty obvious, but it plays a quite important, you know, uh, point in, in, you know, the, the whole theory of calculus of variations. That means that your problem can be localized, you know, to whatever whatever um, place you want to localize it. Okay, um, so the proof of this lemma is pretty obvious. You know, let me just do a picture proof. I mean, you can you can write down, right? So, for example, this is your gamma, whatever. So this is gamma i equals to y, gamma b equals to z. Now you restrict your your your, your your uh, interval of concentrations to only from the two points. Let's say that you restrict it to just gamma C here and gamma D there, right? Just, just a sub interval. And then the, 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 the outside, you don't care. You know, so, you know, for any curve eta in the new admissible set, you know, that have eta C equals to gamma C, and eta d equals to gamma d, this is eta, right? You can see that you can easily extend eta out so that eta is the same as gamma in the, in, 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 in the you know, um, outside of, of the interval cd, right? So, you know, you can just define, you can just uh, set eta as to be, uh, at the tutor S to be at the S itself for S between CD. And elsewhere, you set it to be gamma S for S not in CD. Then you have at the tutor is the admissible set, uh, curve in the bigger interval IB. And because they agree from A to C and from D to B, you can just, you know, when you take the action functional, you know, the, the, the outsider, Agree, so you have you know inside is is a minimizer, so it it's a very simple property, but uh, but if you look at other uh, problems like in infinite Laplacians and for other equations, people call this property like absolute absolute minimizers. What it means is that it's not just a minimizer on an, uh, a a a a big set the 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 given set, but it's also a minimizer on any any um, smaller subset, okay? So that, that, that's that. So I'm using hidden here, this lemma. So, you know, the like on, on each of the sub interval from AI to AI plus one is a minimizer, right? So, um, you know, so hidden there, you know, if it's a, if it's C1 on AI plus one and it's still a minimizer on this interval. So, I mean, maybe let me add it here. So it's C1 on AI plus one and gamma is a minimizer. Also on AI, AI plus one. So from these two property and you use the theorem two, I, I reminded you here, if it's C1 is a minimizer, then it's CK, right? So. Um, from these two properties, you imply that gamma is in CK in H of the subinterval, right? So you have it's CK in H of the subinterval. Um, so really, to finish the proof, you just need to show that you know at 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 the at the connection point, like A I A plus one is C one, right? Then 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 you have gamma is C one on on the whole interval. And having a C1 on the whole interval, then you apply theorem two again, 
you have a sick guy and you satisfy the Euler Lagrange equation. So, um, so let me write here. So we have gamma is in CK of each of the uh, interval. And remember that here, you know, it's in CK including the, the two endpoints, right? So, uh, so just need to show that gamma is C1 in IB. And, and to do this, we just need, uh, you know, actually to show that gamma dot of AI minus equals to gamma dot of AI plus, okay? So, I, I mean, what I mean here is that, you know, this is the point AI, gamma AI, and gamma gamma AI dot minus is the is is the slope approaching from the left, right? And um, okay, um, <laughs> let, let, let me try to draw the, let, let, let me try to draw a better picture. Um, so this is approaching from the left. So this is gamma t for t less than AI. Yeah, approaching it from the left, and then uh, this is in this case. Um, um, this is gamma t for t greater than ai. So if you're approaching it from the left, in this case, the, the, the gamma dot of ai minus is this derivative, right? You're approaching it from the left. And if you're approaching it from the right, you know, you take t greater than ai and, and you go down to t equals to ai, then, you know, in this case, this is going to be gamma dot of ai approaching it from the right, right? And surely in this picture, it's, it's, it's not C1 at, 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 the, at the point AIs, right? So, so, so not C1 at AI in this picture, right? Um, so, uh, so that's what we need to do. I mean, we're gonna need to show that, uh, that gamma dot of AI minus equal to gamma dot of AI plus. So what we are doing here, I mean, um, is that you're not now gonna consider the whole global problem, right? On the whole interval IB, you plug in test function and mess around. Then there are certain, uh, something called, you know, like um, compatibility conditions at those, you know, like connections, those junctions, AI, and the compatibility conditions, if we use it uh, nicely, then it's going to give us certain information to read up, you know, to make an analog of this is a sort of like ranking Hugo Neo condition in conservation laws. You, you use a test function in the whole domain and you see, you can read up information in, in, in the connection things. Okay. But anyway, you don't need that. Um, you know, I'm using big words here. You just do it simply. What you do is that, you know, again, because it's a minimizer, you plug in any smooth function at that, and you use exactly the, the uh, variational method there, right? Um, uh, then you would end up with this equality. You know, you do variations in the eta direction, right? If you forget, maybe let me write down here. So what I meant is that you take eta to be a test function, you define i little s is i of gamma as a minimizer plus s eta, and you say that i of zero is the minimum of i s for s in R, and you differentiate, you're gonna get i prime of zero equal to zero, and this is exactly the integral from a to b, uh, b x in L, gamma gamma dot, multiply uh, dot product with eta plus dv in l gamma gamma dot dot product with eta dot okay so that's exactly uh, that's exactly what i reminded you here okay now again i cannot do integration by parts here i cannot kick the derivative of eta dot you know so what i can't do here is that you know this one it's not smooth enough, right? Uh, this one is not smooth enough. In fact, 
you can only think about it at edge of the sub interval from AI to AI plus one at the junction points for now. We don't even know if the if it's continuous even, not to mention that it's smooth enough so that I can kick the derivative of eta dot to d v, right? So I can't do that. But what I can do is that I can break it into those sub intervals from AI to AI plus one. And when, when I break it into sub intervals from AI to AI plus one, then I can do integration by parts there. Why? Because we just we just proved that that uh, you know gamma is CK in each of the sub interval, right? So when you have gamma is in CK of each of the sub interval, you can do integration by parts there. And that's exactly what we are doing. We are writing it instead of one big interval, we are writing it in the summations of sub intervals from AI to AI plus one, and we are doing integration by parts. We are, we are kicking the derivatives from eta dot to dv. And you see, that's exactly what I'm doing here, right? So, so you know, I have d over dt here. I have d over dt here, and I only have that eta here, right? So you know that that's exactly that. Okay. Um, now, of course, you know, in this case, I don't have that eta is equal to zero at the two endpoints, so I have to take the boundary terms into account. Um, so what's the boundary term? Uh, you know, this whole thing was. Um, you know, uh, was the d over dt of the whole dv dot with eta, right? So you see that when I take the boundary terms into account, I have that this is the upper term, you know, uh, okay, maybe maybe a, a, a picture would help. So this is ai, this is ai plus one. We need to take the upper terms here and because we are going from here to here, so that, that's why I have uh, gamma dot of AI plus one minus, right? So approaching AI uh, plus one from the from the left. And so that, that's that. So approaching AI plus one from the left. And for AI, we are approaching it from the, from the right, right? So that's why I have dV of L of gamma AI, gamma dot of AI at plus, multiply with eta of AI. So I have a bunch of terms like that. It's just account for the boundary terms, you know, never mind what they are. The good thing is that is that this 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 whole um, the good thing is that this this uh, you know whole thing you know up here this whole thing here is equal to zero. Right, because because we have the Euler Lagrange equation in each of the sub interval from AI to AI plus one. So it just goes away. Okay. So when they go away like that, what remains is just that, you know, like um, what remains is just that the boundary terms, the summation of all the boundary terms, gonna be equal to zero, right? So that that's exactly what we have here. So that's exactly this box that uh, you know the summation of all boundary terms equal to zero and here i rearranged the boundary terms a little bit you know because we have just summations of all the sort of telescoping whatever terms so we can rearrange to put everything to be just eta ai you know and when you put that it, it turns out that you know the thing inside the bracket the, the this thing here is nothing oops This thing inside this big bracket here is nothing but the difference in terms of the dv of the uh, left and the right derivatives of gamma dot, um, left and the right derivatives of gamma at ai. Okay? And remember that what are our etas? Our etas are our test functions. We just need to fix that they are zero at the two endpoints. In the between, they can fluctuate at whatever values that you like, right? For example, at AI, I can choose eta of AI to be like that, to be positive, you know, or you can make it to be very positive, or you can make it to be very negative. So the choice of at eta of AI can be anything, right? Can be, you know, can be anything. 
So it means that the eta of AI in the between are arbitrary because they are arbitrary, then that means that the, the purple term, this purple term here gotta be zero. Right? And when it's zero, then that means that, you know, we have this one, right? And, and, and remember that, that our DV, you know, because we assume that it's CK and, uh, and locally uniformly continuous, uh, uh, sorry, locally uniformly convex, so DV of L, is a uh, diffeomorphism, right? So that means that if they are the same, then then the left and the right derivative got to be the same. So gamma is C1, and then it, it implies that right away that gamma is C1 in the whole interval IB. And it implies that gamma is in CK and gamma satisfies the Euler-Lagrange equation, okay? Any questions or concerns for me at this point? Um, you know. So I mean, uh, there, there, there are two simple but very effective point here is that you know, first of all, you know, it's uh, gamma can be thought of as a, an absolute minimizer. So it it's a minimizer, then it's a minimizer in any subinterval. That's the first key point. The second point is that you know you have uh, the local properties that is a minimizer, that's good, but also globally is a minimizer. So you can plug in any test functions that you just need to fix at as A equals to eta B equal to zero, and it can fluctuate anything inside. And when you do that, you break the interval IB into sub-intervals and in intervals you would have that is uh, nice. And then that allows you to, to get certain compatibility conditions here, at which you know you would need to have that, you know, the summations of all the compatibility conditions at the at the corners or junctions AI got to be zero. And that allows you to conclude that gamma has to be uh, has to be uh, C1 at those point AIs on the other. Okay. So so that that's it. You know, now um, let me give you this definitions and then and then we're gonna go to more, some deeper discussion. Uh, and again, I mean, I, I think we have time for, um, you know, like um, for, for open discussion today. We have not a lot of time, but a bit of time. So, I mean, uh, when we define minimizers, it's always the case in countless variation that it turns out that you didn't use all the properties of the minimizer. What we use is just that the first variation. So you take any any eta uh, with the endpoint zero, and you do the variations in in the eta directions is equal to zero. Uh, so that's actually that's the only thing we do. Uh, so you know, um, sometimes. I mean, what people would write, okay, maybe let me write down here. So sometimes, so remark, sometimes we feel good write D over DS of I gamma plus S eta when S equal to zero. This one, you know, you can also write as a uh, Gato derivative. We don't even need this one to be fresher. Just the Gato derivative in the direction eta, this is equal to zero. And sometimes people would write that this, this means that uh, it's equal to zero. And, and this means that, you know, gamma, and they say that gamma is an extreme curve. Or a critical point. I mean, depending on situation. Um, just just notion. And you, you see that actually in all the proofs we have done, we only use this, 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 this property. We didn't use that, you know, it has to be exactly a minimizer to conclude. So uh, what I meant here is that that means that by the same argument, like above, that we can see that if, you know, gamma is a piecewise C1 extreme curve, then it got to be CK as well. And actually I should have said that and, 
gamma also satisfy Euler Lagrange equations. And you know, sometimes that proving existence of, of extremal curves and then uh, critical points as uh, easier than you know existence of minimizers to understand from extremal curves uh, critical points to minimizers. Sometimes we would need to do uh, second variations or something more. But anyhow, that that just that. So that just a remark. Okay. So now, I mean, now now is the point to to go to go further. I mean, I gave the definition here. Uh, but but what what needs to be done is is really something deeper than than this. Okay, so um, so discussion. I recall the the major problem that we care about is the minimizer uh, minimizing problem. Minim minimizing of eta in some admissible set i integral from i to b l of eta eta dot. Yes. Okay. And of course, we we all know, right? I mean that that um, uh, that. Uh, okay. So I would say that earlier. Clearly, I can sit up continuous. This one. C1 curves. Okay. However, I mean the 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 weakness of this one is that is that that this is not compact. Compact. And the reasonable topology. Okay, and, and that is the sort of one of the biggest problem that people face in calculus of variation. Um, you know, roughly speaking, when when people do, I'll, 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 I'll explain why. Um, uh, roughly speaking, when people do calculus of variation, the, when they start doing with the direct method, uh, most of the times, uh, okay, maybe, maybe let me go down here, you know, so that I have more space. And then I'll get back to the definition. As I said, you know, so so most of the times, most of the times for direct methods in calculus of variation, then then what do people do when they try to minimizing this problem? Again, we're gonna come back to this one more. And again, bear with me. You have learned this. We we're gonna go uh, deeper than you know whatever was was done in Evan. So don't worry. So the natural way, and you know, and maybe you know, I I don't know a better way. We if we know nothing, the natural way would be that you know the we first want to make sure that this is not minus infinity. Because if we are minimizing some problem that goes to minus infinity, then we are doomed from the beginning, right? So, so the natural way is that, first of all, we want to make sure that this problem is meaningful. So meaningful meaning that we need to show there exists a constant C greater than zero. So that, again, I will recall this point many, many times in our class, so don't worry. It's greater than equals to minus C for all admissible eta. Because again, otherwise, if we go to minus infinity, then this is not a meaningful problem to start with. So we show that there's a lower bar, right? From here, we imply that the infimum of eta in curly i of i eta, maybe let me name it, exists infinite. Okay? And secondly, once we show that it has a low about, we have the infimum, then a natural and most abstract way that we know, mathematicians, right? If there's an infimum, then there's a sequence approaching that infimum. I mean, what else do we know from, from analysis, right? You know, so, uh, so there exists a sequence eta k in k 
curly i so that we have i of eta k, which is integral from i to b l eta 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 k eta k dot ds. This one gonna converge to the infimum value. Okay. And then from here, typically this is sort of the hardest step is sort of to extract a conversion subsequence at the KJ. So that, you know, okay, I'm, I'm doing hand wavy here. I, I, I gotta be very careful when I'm talking about this. Uh, so that, you know, reasonably you would expect uh, that, you know, at the KJ would converge to some uh, gamma and then I gamma is exactly the mini minimum value. Okay. So that, that's the general strategy. People call this one a direct method in calculus aberration and this is always goes like this. Um, so, the major difficulty lies in the step two goes to three. That is, that's one more step, you know, that, you know, even if I have some conversion like this, what do I mean and how can I conclude this? So there, there's a fourth step here. I'm, I'm, I'm not yet even going to the fourth step. I'm just talking about the step two to step three here. To do this, we could need to do some certain compactness argument, right, you know. Uh, uh, and we are in uh, infinite dimensional spaces here for sure. And most of the times, if we are dealing with C1 or piecewise C1, we wouldn't be able to have nice compactness, nice enough compactness, okay? So, so, so there are two, uh, so two scenario here. Yeah. The, the first scenario, this is a simpler one. If, you, if you're curious, you can read this one in appendix of my book. It's, 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 not, it's not so long, you can just enjoy it if you're curious. Uh, the, 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 the first scenario is a simpler scenario when I assume that I have um, say uniform convexity. So when I assume that I have uniform convexity, then uh, typically you can you can have that L of x uh, v is going to be greater than or equals to some uh, small constant times v minus a big constant c, something like that. You know. So think of the example. You know, in uh, in. Uh, um, uh, classical mechanics, this is one half of V square minus big V of X. So this is that, that, that example. So when you have, when you have this lower bound, what, what do you see in your problem? You have I eta K is equals to integral from A to B L of eta K, eta dot K DX. You know, by using by using the lower bound, this is greater than equals to integral from A to B, some little c at the k dot square d uh, d s. I'm sorry. Minus a big constant c times b minus i. This is not a problem, and surely this is less than a, another constant. Again, my constant here change, changes from line to line. Uh, so bear with me about that. So what I can see here that I can imply that the integral of eta k dot square ds is less than or equal to big constant, something like that. Okay, so that's the most reasonable bound that I can have. So you see that this is not gonna give us anything about that the function is C1 of this y C1, right? Uh, the, 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 the sort of the reasonable sort of set of, of curly A, uh, admissible set. In this case, I can think of is, is eta satisfied that eta A equals to Y, eta B equals to Z, and eta dot is in L2. 
that's a pretty reasonable situation I can think of, right? And you can see that, you know, surely this is this is uh, this is sort of very very uh, elementary for you guys here. That once you have uh, at that dot, okay, in L two of AB is bounded, then you can say that there is the subsequence at the KJ. So that at the KJ dot converges weakly in L2 to some function, you call it uh, gamma dot or something. Uh, so that, that's typically what you can have. So you have nice compactness in, in L2, right? So this is more reasonable. Is it clear or any concerns here? Any concern here? Is it good? Okay. Um, and, and this is exactly the, the sim simple scenario that I have written down and you can you can see it in the in the appendix of my book. It's quite simple and it resolved this this kind of question, right? Again. Uh, we're gonna need to, to make everything clear in detail. So bear with me. Uh, we're gonna do everything uh, from the beginning. So so don't worry. Uh, however, you see that I'm trying to do a, a general setting here. So this is second scenario, and this is more complicated. So our more general setting is more complicated. Is that we didn't assume that we have such a nice quadratic lower bound, right? We only assume that LXV over length of V goes to infinity as V goes to infinity. So it grows faster than, than, than linear speed. That's all we assume. Uh, so I wouldn't be able to put the assumption that, that you know, eta dot is in L2, right? I mean, I don't know, okay? so. So um, it's not reasonable to assume that at the dot is in LP of IB for P bigger than one, since we just don't know if LXV is going to be greater than or equal to C times V to the P minus C or not. Right? Again, I know that it grows faster than linear, but I don't have a quantitative bound of which rate that is blowing up. Does it make sense? Yeah. So, so that's that's a problem. Again, so you see that every everything comes with certain, you know certain problems, right? We are trying to do them for a very general setting, but then we have to pay some price. So it's not reasonable to assume that eta dot is in any LP for P greater than one. The most reasonable thing I can think of is that we can, we can only assume that eta dot is in L1, maybe, right? This is okay because LXV grow faster than V. So we can only assume that it's in L1, okay? And that's exactly, that exactly the space of functions. I'm bringing it up here. So that's the space of absolute continuous curve. Um, again, definition of absolutely continuous curve is just that if you take a bunch of uh, countable number of sequence with, total length less than delta, then the total difference is going to be less than epsilon. Don't worry about that. It's equivalent to the fact that, you know, gamma dot is, is in, CO, uh, so in, in L1. The first two things here say that it's uh, in L1. It exists almost everywhere and in L1. Because normally for an L1 function to say that it uh, exists almost everywhere, you would have to find is sort of like, um, uh, uh, you know, like good representation, whatever that means. Anyway, 
and then and surely you know it's satisfying this property for h of the t in the between right so we are essentially saying that you know the 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 space of thing we can serve is the curly a now is a set of gamma for which i have gamma is in the set of absolutely continuous curve from a b to r n and gamma a equals to y and gamma b equals to z and surely for, i mean you have that gamma dot is in l1 of a b for h of such gamma okay that that's all what i have okay so uh, to n however that's the thing we have to pay for the price here so you have gamma dot is in l1 of course i mean this is um i probably i you know probably a a, a problem that uh, typically asked in certain qualifying exams or certain prelim exams you know certain places right i mean at least it was asked when I did my prelim exam, you know, in my grad school, <laughs> that you, if you have a bounded L1 sequence, then do you have a, 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 a you know, do you have a, a convergent subsequence in L1? And of course not, right, you know. So the, the problem here is that you see below here, when I said that, you know, you have a bound uh, here, down here, you know, again, you have, when you can find a minimizing sequence, you would have about. If you are in L2, you have about of the sequence eta k dot in L2, and you have a convergent subsequence. That's good. You are in L2. Uh, but if you're in L1, uh, however, in L1, if you have this in this example, if you have GN is a bounded sequence, uh, then do you have a conversion subsequence in L1. And that, that's typically a question that, you know, people ask it thousands of times in various of tests, I don't know. And of course it's not, right? I mean, you can only have a conversion subsequence in, in the measure sense. You know, in this example that I, I drew it here, you have the norm of GN in L1 is one because it's, it's a triangle of size two over N with height and right, so the, the length is one, uh, sorry, uh, the area is one, but you surely have the GN converged in the measure sense to a delta derat in the measure sense, right? So we really lose compactness in L1, okay? So to have compactness, I'm gonna do it next time is that, is that, you know, so to have compactness, in L1 and do uh, the, the direct method. In calculus of variation, we would need to have something called tightness condition, right? Okay, uh, I'll send you the notes of, of the next lecture by tonight or something. Um, if I remember, I'll try to make sure everything goes right. Uh, so you would need to have the tightness condition so that you can pass the limit. The tightness condition essentially, you know, saying that for any small set, the integral there, you know, have to be small. So that doesn't allow you to have delta dirac concentrated in, at, at certain locations. Does that make sense? So, um, so I hope that is clear. The, the second point I discussed it a lot is, is about the fact that the earlier set A of admissible curves cannot be as simple as uh, continuous piecewise C1 functions because we wouldn't have compactness. We have to relax the compactness conditions. And in some cases, if we know the growth rate of L, then we have, if it's in L2, LP with P greater than one, then the problem is easier. For our setting, when we only assume that is, um, uh, strict uh, uh, super linear, then it's not that easy. We have to deal with compactness and then I'll recall everything very slowly and carefully, so don't worry. But I hope that uh, it's clear for today what we are talking about. Any question or concerns for me? Um, we have time for a few quick questions.
Um, so tell me if I'm, 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 you know, or email me if, if there's something is not clear, I would be happy to write more notes and uh, explain and send it to you, for example. Um, but really that I'm hopeful that uh, I can explain the whole theory to you in a very simple way. Um, you know, I, I think that I, I, I know how to explain this, this whole book of Fati in a very analysis way now. So it, it's quite fun, um, quite fundamental. You know, it's, it's, it's really close to us actually. It's not really bad in Well, well, it's analysis, okay. So anyhow, uh, so I hope that you have a great weekend, stay safe and healthy and maybe enjoy uh, things a little bit. I mean, uh, enjoy the nature a little bit. Okay, so I see you on Monday. I'll, I'll post the, the, the post notes and then the notes of next lecture uh, tonight or something. Okay, see you, bye.